So, <clears throat> my mom. My mom was a consummate salesperson. Salesperson. She could literally sell ice water to Eskimos. And I, on the other hand, couldn't sell them a parka if they were butt ass naked. I have no idea why this is. Um, I've been studying on it, not really getting me anywhere. I'm gonna prove that by telling you the premise, the thesis, and probably the introduction to the book I've been writing for a while, which is taking 365 days to write, well, kind of, because it's 365 days of gratitude, but it's gratitude sort of flipped upside down because that's what I do. Um, I'm trying to turn the, the tide and, you know, uh, flip the script, flip the script basically on uh, so-called trauma. And I say that not to diminish anybody else's trauma, but to diminish my own perceived trauma because I've decided that for me at least it's a construct of my over-involvement with myself. And that's the thing that is probably the most terrifying to me about what's going on right now is that we're all kind of forced to spend too much time with ourselves and thinking about ourselves. And so I'm going to share this idea because maybe it's, you know, something that somebody else might find useful as a hobby during quarantine, as a way to separate you from things that plague you and separate you from other people maybe, um, or from yourself, because for me at least, my suffering is in direct proportion to my disconnection from myself, from my true nature, and from the people that I love, which is to say everybody, because I truly do love everybody. Not the same, of course, but, well, I mean, I do. But, well, I mean, you lo I love everybody. There are people that I acutely miss and long to see actively, but that's just because I know them. <laughs> Whereas if I don't know you, I don't know to miss you. So anyway, so what I realized at some point was that, that if I chose to, I could learn from my failures, right? But I learned this with my kids. Um, when I, hang on, Shelly's walk twisting me in circles. When uh, one of my kids was, when I, when I felt separate from one of my kids or I felt cut off from them emotionally or, you know, when I felt like I was, they were holding me at arm's length or something and I would look at what I had done because I had to be me, right? And even if it wasn't, that's the only thing I could control, so that's what I looked at. Um, what I found was that if I looked at the thing that was going on from like personal responsibility, self-ownership, then I could, I could uh, address it. I could change it. I could turn it around um, because they were responding to me. And so if, they, if there was bad behavior coming from them, but I couldn't, it's like I, you can't double down on that and say, stop doing that. Nobody's going to do that. But what you can do is you can take away every justification for it and you can eliminate their reasons for wanting to act like that, you know? And you know, human beings are decent at our core. And if you give us a reason to, we'll be kind and we will be decent. And so, um, so in this way, I was able to, you know, grow up and knock off my bullshit. And so then there was gratitude, right? Because... I was grateful to my kids, especially my oldest. He holds me very accountable for things. And I really appreciate that because there's sort of an expression. I'm not sure where I heard it the first time, but something along the lines of what would a normal person do? Well, if you grow up in a lot of chaos and dysfunction, a good thing to try to rewire yourself to be a more functional human being is to think, well, what would a normal person do? You know, so if you're trying to break an addiction or get out of a toxic relationship or just, like I said, grow up, just try to be a more complete person and you realize that maybe some of your early childhood programming or things that you ways that you adapted that aren't serving you well ask yourself what a functional person would do so then when I when I do that like as far as with my kids it's usually you know I'm well being an asshole basically but infringing upon their their boundaries as you know sovereign human beings which I've taken great pains to 
try to try to respect and I and I'm stunned actually by how autonomous my kids are given how dysfunctional and codependent my family of origin was um, and I, 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 I think there's some luck involved there I mean I, I really tried it I tried to do that but at the same time a lot of the things that I tried I, I failed at you know let's just be honest because you don't know what you don't know so my kids know their own minds and you know not nobody's perfect but man they like I said especially my oldest son they, I can just tell by the look on their face when, I've, you know, when I'm standing on their boundaries, you know, or standing on their personal space, or, or when they, when they're going, what the fuck are you talking about, you know? And then I look at that, I go, well, okay, is that them being judgmental, or, or is there a misunderstanding, or am I not communicating it correctly? Um, and I, I love to do this with my kids because I am a person who risks and dares and I'm trying to dare greatly because I believe that that's the way out of our current troubles is for us all to dare you know dare greatly to, to be more bold um, take back some of the joy of life that we lost by you know giving up our responsibilities in lieu of comfort and so-called rights but anyway the point is this that okay let me go back to where I was so there's gratitude okay and the gratitude is because you don't, nobody wants to be an asshole, right? And nobody wants to offend or alienate or um, disturb or push away the people that they care about or anybody, really. Nobody wants to hurt anybody else. And nobody wants to be an asshole. So anytime that I get an opportunity to look at myself and see something that I could do in a way that was more har harmonious, you know, with the greater good or with my family or with the aim that I'm striving for then that's a gift and so this is the way that I've stumbled forward into you know somebody that I can you know look in the mirror and be proud of right and um, is by um, altering my behavior altering my my thinking and so some, somewhere along the line I got the idea that if I was grateful to my kids for the times when they pulled me up short, because some of those times were rather painful, that I could probably extend that gratitude to others who I thought had hurt me, but maybe I'd learned from the breakdown that occurred or the um, so-called you know, betrayal. If you feel like you've been betrayed, we all, we all have those experiences, or somebody has betrayed us. But the thing is, is if you decide that you're gonna learn from that and you're gonna become stronger, then that becomes a gift. And then that person becomes your teacher. And we've heard this, but, you know, in spiritual teachings and whatnot, people have been saying these kinds of things forever, but, you know, they, I don't know, they only penetrate when they penetrate, so, okay, we're doing a potty thing. So, the thing is, is that I realized that if I, if I started to think of those so-called crimes against me as gifts and as opportunities in a very real sense, that I should think and express and feel the gratitude towards those people and then you know if you want to look at it this way I tend, I tend to try to I don't know approach it with love and so I, I really try not to look at it this way but you can it's kind of like you've taken all of their power all of the power out of the thing that they did or didn't do or failed to do or the their thoughtlessness or whatever it was and you've harnessed it you know, you've literally just fucking threw a saddle on that bitch and turned it into your own growth and your own potential and your own greatness and your own joy and your own life, you know? So then it's really kind of not cool to just go on about your way. So I'm writing these thank you notes and they're, sin they're completely sincere. I'm not being snarky at all. Um, I'm writing one right now to Dave Reichert, who was of course the head of the Green River Task Force because it was their intervention that got my parents to quit drinking when I was in the ninth grade, I think. And when they knocked on the door and told my parents I was pen pals with the Green River Killer, which is how my mom liked to tell it. I really wasn't, but it was their number one suspect at the time. And, you know, I was hanging out on the streets a lot and being a bad kid and this cab driver. I don't know, you can look him up, look him up. His name is Mill. He was their suspect at the time and he'd written me some letters and stuff and given me a bunch of jewelry. 
you know, the jewelry and the little bags that fell off the back of a truck, I think. But the point is, it was the day after Thanksgiving, and my mom says that, you know, they, that was the moment that they realized how far out of control they were. And uh, all I remember was that they were driving a 1975 Camaro or something, and I had to sit in the Camaro and have an interview with his partner while he talked to my parents, and I just thought that was very strange. I didn't really know very much, but it was very interesting. So, but I'm writing him a letter because he's an older man, and he's done a lot of really good things in his life and in his career, obviously. And like I said in the letter, he probably doesn't even remember this. But the thing is that, well, the way that they found me was through a psychic, which is strange, but it's true. Can't make this shit up. Uh, named Barbara Cubic Patton. And uh, she just described me and told him where I hung out. And, you know, they tracked me down. I don't know. It's very strange. But they didn't have to do that, you know? Obviously, they wanted the information, whatever information that I might possibly have. But what she told them that what I, that was that I was in danger. And Dave Reichert is a decent man. I think he's a Christian and he's got a family and he's taking really good care of his kids. And, is, you know, he's a good man. He's a decent person. And so all the good things that he's done in his life, I don't know how many times he's been thanked. But that's not the point. The point is that I don't know what might have happened if they hadn't quit drinking at that moment. That was the moment that I started to pull in my horns, you know, and try to be decent and I've always given the cre that credit to my oldest niece and she deserves most of it or my sister and you know but also because you know, I loved that kid and the ones that came after there was no way I was going to get cut off from him and there was no way I was going to be able to see him if I was continuing my shit but the thing is Dave Reichert and his partner and that whole thing they deserve some credit too and some appreciation because my parents had seven sober years and uh so I'm writing him a letter and it's taking me forever because it's one of the ones that I've been wanting to write for the longest and then, but I've written others to people who you know, broke my heart or, um, uh, you know, I felt hurt me and it, all the sting is gone. You know what I mean? Like whatever sting there was. So. Anyway, this is a long video and I'm kind of babbling, but I just wanted to say that this has been hugely liberating for me and, and, uh, you don't obviously have to write letters, but just thinking of maybe flipping things on their ear or on their ass or whatever and looking at them from a different angle might help you see a solution that you didn't see before or, or a way that it is a plus instead of a minus or can be a gift instead of trauma I don't know but so buy the book anyway when it comes out because I'm going to be self-publishing it and you know so um and there's a lot of other good stuff but the point is try something new and I love you have a good day